Thank you, Michael. I'm not going to sum up yours right now because I'm going to allow Suman. Suman, all yours. Suman Sahai, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's not very often that you get an opportunity to discuss science and technology and its benefits in a gathering like this. So I particularly appreciate that India has put together this agenda. Um, Michael has just laid before you very comprehensively and in great detail all the classical arguments that are put out in defense of genetic engineering and genetically engineered crops. There are some things that I agree on. There are many that I don't. As a practicing laboratory scientist trained in genetics myself, there are a few things that I'd like to clarify. The oft-repeated phrase that genetic engineering is very precise is not true. Genetic engineering so far as we use it today is actually a very imprecise technology. We can neither guide the gene to where we want it, nor can we get the number of copies of a gene that we want. If I want to put in two genes, I can't. I shoot in genes into a cell and I wait for something to happen. So there's a great randomness to this technology, which is all right, provided you take on that randomness on board and then work with the fact that it is not a precise technology and therefore you have to work with the fact that you will have to deal with safety testing. On the question of whether this is repeated very often, the starving millions, the hungry hordes, the growing population, and how genetic engineering is one of the important tools to address this problem. There is no evidence of this so far. Whether genetic engineering will also play a role will be seen in the future. Today the technology is very restricted. Its application is wide. Its offer is very restricted. But unfortunately the mythology of genetic engineering is replete with examples that are not substantiated by fact and by the reality. So if we really talk about hunger, we need to look at a number of things that are happening and a technology solution that many, many social scientists have looked at it already. Hunger happens when essentially two things happen. One, the person does not have access to productive assets like land, water, to grow that food, or does not have a job and enough money in the pocket to buy that food. We have today in this country and in many other countries in Asia a tremendous amount of genetic potential in the crops that we have that we cannot realize, that we are not realizing because farmers do not afford enough fertilizer, soil health cannot be maintained, and a number of questions that have been very well understood. Certainly technology can play a role, but to give a credence to a technology beyond what the technology has so far shown is perhaps misguided. On the question of whether BT Brinjal was a misguided decision, I would obviously defer. Not because I think that you should have banned BT Brinjal, but because of all the things that had gone wrong with BT Brinjal. Ladies and gentlemen, I present before you the thesis that this is a regulated technology. This technology has got to be regulated cautiously because scientists have acknowledged that there are safety concerns. Regulation was asked for not by political leaders, not by civil society, not by NGOs, but by scientists. Therefore, we must take seriously the question of the safety of these products and the fact that it is regulated. BT Brinjal went through a series of processes. There were grave and outstanding questions about the way it had been regulated. This country has a policy on mandatory labeling of GM foods. This is the policy we've represented in all of the meetings of the Codex Alimentarius internationally. Yet when we gave permission, or the GIAC gave permission for BT Brinjal release, the country has not got as yet a labeling infrastructure or mechanism in place. So we are in violation of our own rules. We do not have as yet a liability clause. We do not have a law that will grant compensation and redress in the event if something goes wrong. There have been huge questions raised about the nature of the testing that was done. So this is not to attack the technology, but it is to attack 
this fairly atrocious regulation that it was accompanied by. And therefore to say that it was a decision that cannot be defended, I disagree with. It is a decision that should have been taken at least on the count of failure of regulation and paucity of evidence that in fact it had been tested to the extent that it could be proven to be safe. Again on the question of hunger, look at India. And often India is held up as this example of how our population will grow and how we need to feed more people. Go back to the map of India and see how much of India is irrigated. There is 60 to 70 percent of Indian arable land where crops can grow which is not irrigated. Before you get into a technology fix, all that you need to do doubling, trebling of the food production in this country is to bring water to these areas. When you bring water to areas that are growing only one crop a year today and where you can then develop two crops or maybe even three crops a year, you will not just double food production, you will probably treble it. The golden rice issue was raised. Golden rice may or may not deliver, but I want to put before you the fact that India and countries like India have a huge genetic variability in the crops that they grow. India is the birthplace of rice, the center of origin of rice and of several other kinds of crops. We have properties that are in golden rice in many other kinds of varieties of food plants. We have golden millets. We have golden sweet potato. So if you're really wanting a vitamin A fix, you don't have to engineer rice. You have many kinds of rice that are nutritious. There are other kinds of staple foods that will deliver vitamin A and deliver it in much more effective ways than perhaps golden rice will. I'm not shutting the door on golden rice. And by the time I finish this rebuttal, and I could rebut a lot of other things, Michael, we can do that over tea. But to say that to present the thesis that this technology is central or even exclusive to solving our problems is misplaced. This technology may one day play a role. Today there are just two genes, the Bt and the herbicide tolerance. I disagree also with the data that Michael put forth on pesticide reduction. Those data are controversial. But you can. You can make a case for Bt cotton, but can you make a case for 35 crops with the Bt gene? And that is the point, ladies and gentlemen, that I make about implementing a technology. By now you would think that despite being a geneticist, I am firmly an anti-science or an anti-technology person. I'm not. I can't be. I'm trained in science. I've done science in the laboratory for the best part of my life. But I have to put before you the fact that neither science nor technology operates in a vacuum. Just as science can do a lot of good, its application can also do a lot of bad. You have Einstein's theory of relativity. How many people know that the GPS, the navigation in your car and the GPS in your phone actually derives from the theory of relativity? That is how easily you can adopt sophisticated science for human applications and derive benefit from it. But it's the same GPS that is used in drone airplanes that bomb the hell out of places. When you did nuclear fission, when Enrico Fermi did nuclear fission in a sports field in Chicago and started understanding the atom and fission, it led to the nuclear reactor, to the Manhattan Project, to the bomb, and then to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, there is a purity about science that I'm all for, but there may not always be a purity in the application of science when science turns into technology. If you look at genetic engineering, it comes from very, very straightforward work by an Austrian priest called Gregor Mendel. In 1860, when we were roughly wrapping up our first war of independence of 1857, an Austrian priest was working out the principles of heredity. And this Austrian priest laid the foundation of genetics, of understanding heredity, which has been of extreme importance in understanding human disease. We've understood how to make pedigrees to see the transmission of disease. 
We've understood how to tackle disease, but we've also, out of that theory of genetics and the understanding of genes and heredity, developed amniocentesis, sex determination, the killing of girl fetuses, atrocious gender ratios like 750 females to 1,000 males in many parts of our own country and outside. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, science and technology do not operate in vacuums. The onus on us is to take science and technology and to make it work for us. You think we have seen a lot with genetic engineering? How many of you are aware of the new science, which is not even five or six years old, synthetic biology? I just like a show of hands, please, if I may. How many of you are aware of synthetic biology? Good idea. What happens with synthetic biology? You can actually construct, this is artificial genetics, you can actually construct new life forms with synthetic biology. You can take DNA, which is essentially a chemical, you can buy it off the shelf from companies that sell oligonucleotides, which are little clumps of DNA, and you can paste it together in the lab and create new life forms. In fact, Craig Venter, who's a brilliant scientist, has finished creating a, an artificial bug called Mycoplasma Laboratorium. And what Venter's group did, and this is the brave new world of science, what Venter's group did was to strip this bacterium called Mycoplasma, genitalia in this case, and pack it with completely new DNA. And he created out of that an artificial organism called Mycoplasma Laboratorium. Before that, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. had reconstructed the virus that caused the Spanish flu, which incidentally killed 100 million people in 1918, after the First World War. This is the brave new world of science. Let me tell you as a practicing laboratory scientist, accidents will happen. Test tubes will break, petri dishes will break, solutions will spill, and however highly technically organized your laboratory is for safety, accidents happen. Murphy's Law operates. And therefore, it is also important to realize that not all risks can be contained. Not all risks can be controlled. So what does that mean? When you have an artificial organism, like created out of synthetic biology, what can you get? Think of bio warfare. If you have an anthrax attack, you know what anthrax is. You know how to deal with it. After it's killed a few people, you will have an antidote, you can put it into place. You know the bug, you know anthrax.